Uh, so I've been studying in the U.S. Congress on social media since about 2010. I focus mostly on Twitter because that's where they were most active originally, uh, and then because <coughs> my expertise is in Twitter uh, and it's part of this week's platform. Also, the data is very easy to get, um, which makes it easy to teach students how to use it for a uh, method. So. Um, I think that parts of my talk are actually going to be very similar to the end of the last session. Uh, uh, sort of text mining, but also what are some computational approaches that we can use given the scale of these data. So I'm going to show you three different projects, um, and I'm happy to talk about others that I'll mention really briefly. So uh, instead of making slides, um, should go with the full. There you go. Uh, I'm going to show you some GitHub notebooks, uh, Jupyter notebooks on GitHub, because that's where I do my computational work. So I'm trying to sort of expose some of the process of doing these analyses while I talk about them. So this first one is called Purple Tag. Um, Purple Tag is our effort to see whether or not it's possible to measure polarization, so political separation, using only data from Twitter. And the reason that we developed polar, uh, Purple Tag, we also call them polar scores or polar user scores, um, is that the existing measures of polarization mostly rely on votes, and votes are so infrequent that we can't really tell how things change over time. And they usually get summed over entire congresses, so we're waiting like two years to make measures of polarization. And the idea that we would use text instead is taking off, there are a couple of um, party manifesto studies that do this in Europe, uh, and then uh, congressional speeches, press releases, that sort of how can we use text as data instead of having to wait for votes, so we used tweets. And it turns out that Congress separates itself very well in uh, its hashtag use, so we don't actually need anything except the hashtags that they use and their party labels to develop this measure. Um, and so what Purple Tag does is grab all the tweets, um, can we see those? Uh, okay, so first we compute the value for a hashtag. So here some of the tags are raise the wage, uh, then Obamacare. Um, they run negative to positive, and the infinitely negative is roughly liberal, and infinitely positive is roughly conservative. Um, I say roughly because we actually need a multi dimensional measure rather than a two dimensional measure um, to get at some of the variations. Um, but so these are. Um, meaning that raise the wage was basically used only by Democrats. Uh, and at this point, Obamacare, when we made this readme, was used only by Republicans. And one interesting thing about these tags is that sometimes they become contested, and now Democrats own Obamacare when they figured out that that was actually good messaging, uh, and Republicans no longer say it. Um, and so they, there's some switch, which we can capture because we're able to measure these over time uh, and how they change. And then we sum the scores of these tags to get member of Congress scores. Um, so no surprise at the time, uh, Speaker John Boehner was the most conservative person on Twitter, uh, and Nita Lowley and Senator Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin were most liberal. Those are not surprising. These are incredibly uh, conservative and liberal people, and so it matched up. Um, and then we are able to make some visualizations. This one isn't active, but it shows how raise the wage sort of took off. Um, so this shows us when did the Democrats really start to own this minimum wage tag. So this is about raising the minimum wage. Uh, and so we see that there's a break, sort of a slope change in May, where they started to own this issue. And so being able to capture the polarization of a particular conversation helps us measure these changes over time to see when do various issues become more or less salient on the Twitter platform, and then we can measure when do they become more or less salient in other places, whether it's the news or the congressional record uh, or in press releases, to help us see whether or not social media has impacts on elections, whether it has impacts on news media, uh, and whether it impacts our sort of public agenda. So being able to take these measures over time is incredibly useful. Purple tag is public, you can see it um, on GitHub. Now I'm going to switch to something private. Uh, so, Joy and I don't remember what year it was. I think it eventually came out in 2013. But I did a study about what does Congress do on Twitter where we 
built a supervised model uh, where we labeled some hundreds of tweets to figure out uh, according to speech accuracy. So if we assume that every speech is an act, every speech turn is an action, well, what's the purpose of that action? So what is the speech purpose of a particular tweet? So we have that it's a narrating function, meaning it's telling us about the person's day. Uh, it has a positioning function where it's staking a claim and position uh, in relation to an issue or to a person, providing information. This is a, I'm going to be appearing on Tuesday on Sunday. Um, requesting actions, that's saying, you, audience, do this thing, uh, or then there's this thanking, which is like thanking and congratulating your constituents mostly for things that they've done well, like congratulations, Villanova, which is a sad tweet for us in Michigan. Uh, so we retrained, I just retrained this model to see if the sort of the relative use of these various speech acts has changed over time. So does Congress do anything differently in 2018 than they did in 2013? Surprise, no. Uh, it's still nearly all, it's mostly they provide information. Um, and then sort of what kinds of information. So the model in this case is a logistic regression. I also ran uh, support vector machines and um, a naive Bayes that does basically the same as logistic, and I'll talk about that in a second, and then uh, now I'm going to a random forest too. And the reason that I use the logistic, because it compares, but it basically is the same as the naive Bayes output, is because the output of the logistic is human readable. So I can tell why is it making these decisions? Why does the classifier think that this particular tweet is a position tweet? Or why does it think that it's, um, a requesting action to me. And the requesting action one I think is kind of funny because does anybody here still use Follow Friday? Do you remember Follow Friday? Yeah. 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 Only Congress, as far as I can tell, is still using Follow Friday and they love it. Every Friday they're like, oh, check it out. You gotta see my homie in the House of Representatives. And it's like, that's not a thing anymore, guys. <laughs> uh, but here it is, Follow Friday, right up there at the top. You're like, yep. Um, and it's the weights here are sort of how more likely is it to be in this category than in others. Uh, and then, personally important to me is the idea that these marriage quality discussions were mostly positioning this question, discussions. Um, other conventions that they've adopted are the In Case You Missed It, which I think uh, Follow Friday, even though I make fun of it, it does demonstrate some Twitter literacy. Um, as Katie mentioned, they're sometimes not the most literate group of people. Of Watch the hearings. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Tell me the internet. What? Uh, but this, in case you missed it, is pretty, uh, it's pretty Twitter savvy for this group, which looks like they're hiring better people to me. Not that they're actually becoming more literate themselves, uh, but they're hiring better people. Um, okay, so this is a supervised classifier. Um, we also have an unsupervised classifier. So labeling data is very expensive. It takes a long time. So we're trying to figure out if we can capture some of these uh, topics or speech types without having to label the data. Um, and I don't have results for you today because my student made me promise not to share them until she finishes class this week. But they're good. Uh, that we are actually able to capture um, in an unsupervised topic model I, what I think are actually genres of tweets. Um, so, as mentioned earlier today, news articles have a genre and that influences how the topic model performs. I think that an unsupervised topic model on Twitter actually uncovers those genres and tells us about the topic, which is that a single tool, computational tool can do two things is actually really useful. But the topic model itself is only useful in that it exposes things for humans to evaluate. So we don't just say, look, the topic model output. We then use the topic model output to, under, to make some other understanding about what's happening. Um, and then, uh, something that's less computational. Um, so, and then, sure, kind of, okay. This is followyourleaders.org. It's also open uh, and live. And it takes all this Twitter data that I've been collecting and exposes it to users so that you can see what have members of Congress been talking about on Twitter. Um, and the goal is it's built uh, in MongoDB and is modular so that it's actually leader agnostic. 
So we should be able to plug in any group of leaders and have it make these same um, calculations, which are just, right now, they're just hashtags and most frequently used uh, URLs. So we have hashtags over time for the people, and I've just loaded a random person. Um, and then we can see their tweets over time. Uh, and then the most frequently tweeted URLs, which we have a patch coming this week that extends the URLs, so Bitly won't show up there anymore, it'll be the actual URL. Uh, but it can tell you a little bit about what information, when they're sharing information, what information are they sharing and from whom. Um, and we can show, we'll just pick a random Democrat here. Uh, we can compare between two people to see some of the differences that occur. So for instance, you could pick your two senators. You could pick your senator and your representative. Um, we could fall on the homepage of the two party leaders. Um, and they can sh you can see I have a lot more data for one than for the other. And it might be because she was elected leader, or it might be because right now we're honoring Twitter's 3200 limit. Um, but we have nine years of data, so we'll add more data. Uh, yeah, and this Twitter.com is also a shortening problem, but if you look here, they're usually pointing to themselves, which is not surprising. You're like, oh look, you can learn more about me. Uh, and so I think my point in these talks is that the what's happening, or the ways in which politicians are using Twitter is actually really useful both for constituents to understand and for those of us who are interested in political communication and that they're producing just unheard of amounts of data that we now need to use computational approaches to understand them because the rate at which they produce data is just so fast. Uh, and I was at the Midwest Political Science Association meeting last week and there were probably 15 sessions about social media and the computational analysis of social media. And three years ago we got results from reviewers that said social media doesn't matter for politics, not accepted. Uh, so there's a change in political science research to recognize that there's something useful and significant happening here as well. Thanks for attending.